There comes a point in your programming journey when your project grows beyond a single function or a single file. When it takes the step from smaller and simpler projects, perhaps a single file Arduino project or an example project such as blinking an LED or just some simple tutorial to projects that do more than just a simple thing. At some point, it just doesn't make sense to put everything into a single place and you have to start thinking about how you divide and organize your code. Or in other words, you have to think about your software architecture and while the project I'm covering in this series isn't huge by any means, it's definitely big enough to warrant multiple files and some upfront thinking about how to organize the software. So hello and welcome back to Artful Bytes and to another video in this video series where I'm programming an embedded system from scratch. In a previous video I showed you the hardware block diagram for this sumo robot and in this video I'm going to do something similar but instead of for the hardware I'm going to do it for the software. Overall software design and software architecture and organizing software is a very broad and context dependent topic and I'm going to touch on it in some way or the other in most of the videos throughout this video series and I'm also far from an expert on it and I don't expect to do this subject any justice in this small video or even throughout this video series and what I can only hope to do is to just give you a small glimpse of this subject from my limited point of view. With that said in this video I'm going to talk about why you should organize your software and why it's good to come up with a decent software architecture before you go ahead with your implementation. It may seem obvious, but I think it's important to emphasize some of the strong reasons for doing this because we should always ask ourselves why we do what we do. And then I want to spend most of this video talking about the software architecture I came up with for this project. I've actually drawn a diagram to describe the modules of the software and how they relate to each other. And I want to use this diagram as a talking point. I will talk about the topic of software design in general to some degree but mostly I want to center my discussion around this particular project because I think it's easy to get carried away when talking about the topic of software design and end up talking in very general and vague terms which is not very useful and I want to remain practical in this video and in this video series. So putting things into perspective this video is mostly about looking at the software from above and the future videos and the implementation videos are going to be about slotting in the organizational details that is uh, what files to create and what functions to create and how to organize the software within those functions. Okay, so why should you even care about organizing your software and coming up with a decent software architecture? Simply speaking, having a good design helps you develop better software faster. Dividing statements into functions and grouping functions into modules and organizing modules into an architecture and so on makes your code easier to reason about. One of the big limitations we are constantly trying to work around is our limited brain. Our brain can only process a small chunk of information at a time and one of the main ways we work around this limitation is by dividing bigger problems into smaller sub problems. That is the principle of divide and conquer. And this also applies to software because code that is well organized is easier to implement and even more importantly it's easier to read and easier to understand because as software developers we spend more time actually reading software than writing it. It also makes our software and code easier to maintain and to extend. Code that is separate well is easier to maintain because changing one part of the code doesn't unexpectedly affect all other parts of the code and it makes the code easier to extend because it's more obvious where the next thing should go and it also makes the project easier to scale because we don't constantly have to refactor our code all the time. It also makes collaboration easier because if your code is organized well it's much easier for new developers to get up to speed and start contributing to your project instead of them having to spend a lot of time just understanding the code. And it's also going to be much easier to collaborate on the project in parallel because if the different parts of the project is separated well different people can work on different parts of the project without colliding with each other. It's also going to make your code easier to reuse port and test. Good separation means that you can reuse functionality across projects because you will often find that when you develop a new project that you want to reuse some functionality from an older project and if that code is separated into an isolated module it's going to be much easier to reuse that code in your new project and this is basically the entire idea behind shared libraries and related to this is making the code portable and I think this is especially relevant for embedded systems where we are coding against a particular hardware platform. 
it's important that we separate our platform dependent code from our platform independent code because for example there is going to be some part of our project that is dependent on the particular hardware we're working on some of the code is going to interact directly with the registers of say a microcontroller but a lot of the code is also going to be separated from this platform dependent code and it's going to be platform independent and we really want to separate these two layers of the code to make it as easy as possible to change platform if we have to do that or to make our code easy to port to another platform and this is highly relevant now that there are chip shortages and many companies realize they have to change to another microcontroller or another chip because the one they initially chose uh, ran out of stock and this also makes the code easier to test because if we have separated the platform independent code from the platform dependent code we can actually test the platform dependent code in platform independent code in isolation and this is actually exactly what I'm going to do in this video series later on when I simulate the project uh, on a simulator that runs on a host computer okay so these are not all of the reasons but I think these are some of the most important ones and now I want to move on to the next part of this video. Now that we are clear on why we should organize software, let's take a look at how I have organized the software in this project. First I'm going to explain how I have organized the software and then I'm going to talk more about why I have organized it this way. What you see here is my attempt at a software architecture diagram of my Sumo robot. It's a collection of boxes or modules that represents a single idea or concept in the code and I've organized them in a way from low to high, meaning that the boxes or the modules higher up in the diagram are further away from the microcontroller and less dependent on the hardware. And I've divided the modules into two big categories, drivers and application. And drivers in this context encapsulate the modules that are dependent on the hardware, in this case the microcontroller. So the code in these modules will contain code that interacts directly with the microcontroller, for example, by reading and writing to registers to configure the individual peripherals of the microcontroller. And the modules inside the application layer are independent from the hardware. I mean, the modules inside the application layer might as well run on the host computer as far as they know, because they don't contain any code that is directly dependent on the particular microcontroller I'm using. I've also drawn some arrows and organized the different modules above each other to represent the different dependencies and relationships between the modules. So for example, the trace and printf module depends on the UART module. So starting from the top at the application layer, I have the state machine. And this is the big machinery that makes the decisions. It takes the input from the sensors, uh, that is the enemy detection and the line detection, and makes decision based on this and outputs a drive command to the motors. It's going to have three different states, uh, search, attack and retreat. And you can probably guess what each of these states are going to entail. I'm not going to explain them in further detail now. We'll get to that in a later point in this video series. And this whole state machine is going to be the bulk of the application code. And the main idea with the modules underneath the state machine is to simplify the output and the input from the driver layer. I mean, for example, the data I get from the range sensor driver is going to come in an array or a struct of uh, integer values that represents the distance detected by each sensor. And the enemy module is going to translate these values into a more rough representation. So instead of providing the state machine with a struct of integer values, the enemy module is going to translate that into a rough representation, which is going to be like tell whether the enemy is close or nearby or whether the enemy is to the left or to the right or in the front and by simplifying the input this way it's going to be much easier to deal with the input in the state machine and similarly the line module is going to tell whether the line is in front or at the back or to the right and the drive module is going to simplify the interface to the motors so instead of the state machine having to give a distinct duty cycle, it's going to ask the drive module to rotate, uh, go to the front or make an arc turn and whether it should do that in a fast or slow way. And then it's up the drive module to translate that into something that makes sense to the driver layer. And the trace and printf module to the left here are responsible for providing functions uh, that the state machine can use to print messages to a console on a host computer. And the printf module here is actually an external project that I'm going to use because the regular printf uh, implementation in the standard library is too large for an embedded system. So I'm using this external project 
project instead that is optimized for a smaller system with smaller memory. And the trace and printf module uses the UART to write characters to the UART line, which is then going to be connected to the host computer via USB. And then to the right here, I have a module called timer, which is going to provide functionality for measuring the time elapsed which is going to be used by the state machine to keep track of how long it's been in a certain state so it can time out and go to another state if it gets stuck for example it's also going to be used to create different movements so maybe drive to the left for one second for example and moving one level below to the driver layer the code that is dependent on the hardware i first have a module called mcu init which stands for microcontroller initialization and this module will take care of initializing the microcontroller, so it will have functions that run at boot. So for example, it's going to be responsible for configuring the clock rate, as well as initializing the IO pins. And then there is the UART driver, as I've already talked about before. It's going to have code that configures the UART peripheral to be able to send characters over the UART line to the host computer. And uh, then I have the driver for the range sensor, as well as the I2C driver. And similar to the UART driver, the I2C driver is going to have code that writes to the registers related to the I2C peripheral. And the I2C driver is just uh, focused on providing functionality for sending things over I2C. And the module above, the VL53L0X, is going to hold the code that knows what messages to send over I2C to communicate with the range sensor. And I have a similar division for the line sensor. For the line sensor, I'm going to use the ADC peripheral to know whether the line is detected or not. And the ADC module takes care of setting up the ADC peripheral as well as uh, writing to the registers to read the values of the ADC pins. And then it's up to the module above here to look at ADC values and decide whether the line is detected by a single sensor or not. And then there is a module for the IO remote and this module is going to use the timer peripheral to parse the input from the IO receiver. And the PVM module here is also going to make use of the timer peripheral to create the PVM signal sent to the motor driver. And the module above here represents the motor driver and it's going to make use of the PVM module below it as well as configure the right IO pins to set the direction the motor should drive in. And then there is a smaller LD module here that will hold the code for toggling the IO pin that blinks the small test LED I have on my PCB. And below all of these drivers, I have drawn a bigger box or module called IO because all of these drivers or modules make use of IO pins, either by muxing the IO pin to their peripheral or by toggling a GPIO pin or installing an interrupt for a particular pin. And this IO module is going to hold functions for configuring the individual pins. It's also going to keep track of the pin mapping by having an enum that names all of the pins and maps them to corresponding pin numbers. And finally, I have this module here called Millis. And if you're familiar with the Millis function from the Arduino library, you will already know what this does. It's going to provide a function called Millis that gives us the time elapsed since the microcontroller was booted. And I'm actually going to repurpose the watchdog to implement this functionality. So I'm not going to use the watchdog for its normal purpose in this project, but I will talk more about this uh, later on. Overall, this diagram is pretty simple and high level and contains few details uh, because at this stage, it's mostly about sketching out an overview and filling out the exact details on how this should be implemented is going to be the work of the future programming videos of this uh, video series. And this diagram will help us stay oriented while we work through the implementation. But since this project is simple, even at this level, this diagram gives a pretty good idea of what files we will have to create. I mean, most of these modules are going to map pretty cleanly to single pairs of header and implementation files. Going over this a second time, there are some things I'm not entirely satisfied with here. And when I get to the implementation, I might shift things around. So I will see how this turns out in the end. But overall, I'm pretty satisfied with this division of modules. Now that you've seen the diagram, you might be asking yourself, why did I organize the software this way? Where did all of these modules come from? 
and why did I organize them in this manner? First of all, I've already implemented this project, which is kind of cheating because in hindsight, I can confidently fill in all the parts because I've already made all the big decisions. Normally at this stage of a project, there's going to be many more unknowns and the design is something you clarify over time as you explore more of the implementation. Secondly, I would be lying if I said that I had a rigid formula for coming up with a good design. I think much of software design comes down to common programming sense, a sense that you develop as you work on more projects. I mean, with experience, you kind of build up an intuition for what makes sense and what doesn't. But of course, when you take on the role as a software architect, you should not only rely on your intuition, because after all, software is a very logical field and yields itself to a lot of theorizing, which means that a lot of books have been written on it and many principles and common patterns have been distilled. And if you want to get good at software design, you should probably pick up a book or two to familiarize yourself with the most common principles and patterns. And I have left a link in the description to a blog post summarizing some of the most useful resources on this topic. And this is a blog called Embedded Artistry and it's actually a good blog to follow in general if you are getting into embedded systems. But while you can theorize a lot about software design, I also think it's a topic that it's easy to over theorize, especially when the project is not huge as in this case. So I don't want to spend too much time talking about it in general terms and instead focus on talking about what I've done for this particular project and you can't really learn software design by just reading about it. Yes, reading books can help you build a better mental bank so you get better at recognizing certain problems and common solutions to those problems but you have to actually work on real projects to synthesize that knowledge and this is kind of the entire premise of this video series as well as my YouTube channel you learn by working on actual projects. Now, with all of that said, I still want to try to explain my reasoning behind this architecture. First of all, to create a sensible architecture, you must first understand the problem you're dealing with, because if you fully understand the problem, the architecture comes more easily. Because in short, architecting software boils down to breaking things into logical sections, modules, or boxes. Boxes that encapsulate a single idea or concept and then to define the relationship between these boxes and separating into boxes and defining what should go into these boxes often just comes as a consequence of breaking down the problem into smaller sub problems and in this case the big problem is to make this sumo robot uh, look at the enemy and push it out of the ring while still staying inside of the ring itself and the sub problems are how we control the motors and how we take input from the sensors how we configure the peripherals on the microcontroller and how we make sense of the input and translates that into useful output to the motors and so on and the nice thing about an embedded system compared to other software projects is that we actually have actual hardware we can refer to i mean the hardware is to some degree just another representation of the problem or the solution to the problem and therefore it can be extremely useful to use the hardware block diagram as a reference or guide when we architect our software. Just looking at the separations in this block diagram, it naturally follows that the code for the range sensors should be different from the code for the line sensors, which should be different from the code for the motor drivers and different from the code for the IO receiver. And the I2C is conceptually different from the GPIO and UART is conceptually different from the PVM. Things that are conceptually one idea or one thing in the hardware should also be one thing and separated in the software design. For example, this box represents the UART driver and it makes sense to conceptualize that as one thing because that is one thing in the real world. It maps to a single peripheral on the microcontroller and the same goes for the I2C box. It represents the driver for the I2C peripheral, which is one thing in the real world. These things are conceptually different from each other and should also be different from each other in the code. And the same goes for the relationships between these boxes. I mean, it makes sense for the enemy module to depend on the range sensors because we use the range sensor input to determine whether we detect the enemy or not but it doesn't make sense for the enemy module to have any kind of dependence to the PVM module because that is only used by the motor driver to control the motors and we don't need to control the motors to detect the enemy so it wouldn't make sense for the code in the enemy module to have anything to do with the PVM module. So those two should be separated. And if I'm going to classify my approach here in terms of patterns, I would say that this is some flavor of the layered uh, architecture pattern, meaning that's an architecture mostly represented by 
abstraction layers. And this is a very common and suitable pattern for embedded systems. And this whole thinking I'm trying to convey here also maps to many of the principles I've listed. Separating and making the boxes independent from each other ties into the ideas of decoupling and modularity. And boxing in independent and separate ideas ties into the idea of separation of concern as well as the single responsibility principle. And further on by realizing that the IU code would be used by many of the modules and by putting that into a single place and a single module, I avoid repeating myself in the code because I can have code used by many modules in a single place. And that follows the principle of don't repeat yourself, the dry principle. And this also relates to the principle of cohesion, that is putting related code as close to each other as possible. And building in layers, I mean the boxes in the driver layer abstracts the details of the microcontroller and the boxes in the application layer don't really know anything about the microcontroller. And this is the principle of encapsulation, uh, that is hiding details. And this also helps achieving modularity because we can replace the bottom layer without affecting the upper layers. And this once again ties into the idea of decoupling. Actually, one of the most important things when it comes to architecturing software for embedded systems is to decouple as much of the code as you can from the hardware or the processor. We want the application layer to be independent from the hardware and it's very easy to accidentally couple code to the hardware which makes it hard to port the code further down the road if you end up having to change the processor. And besides making the code more portable in general, as I said before, I have a very specific reason for why I want to separate the application layer from the driver layer, because it makes it much easier to run the application layer in isolation on a host computer, which is what I'm going to do later on when I run the simulation. And related to this is making the code testable. By separating the application layer, I've made it much easier to test the application layer in isolation and while I'm not strictly going to test my code or well in my defense simulation is a form of testing just thinking about testing at the stage of designing software often makes your software design better because you have to think more about how you separate things in a good way as I hope you might realize from all my talking is that you don't necessarily have to think actively about all of these principles or patterns when you design your software. Of course, it's good to have this in the back of your head, but you can come a long way with just mere logical reasoning. And you will often find that by thinking logically about the problem and dividing the problem into smaller problems in a logical manner, that you actually apply many of these principles automatically. Now I've babbled enough and I'm going to try to end my discussion here before I get too vague. And I would rather just get to the implementation sooner. If what I've said here, or if some of the sections in this diagram don't make sense yet, don't worry. They should become more clear as I work on the implementation in the coming videos. But before I end, I want to again remind you that the whole reason for designing software is to achieve the whys I talked about before. It should make the code easier to port, easier to understand, easier to test, and easier to collaborate on, and so on. And it's easy to realize how doing things a different way could go against some of these whys. For example, if the UART code wasn't separated from the I2C code, then changes in the UART code could unexpectedly lead to changes in the I2C code, which in turn would affect things dependent on the I2C code. And this would make the software harder to understand, to maintain and to extend, and also harder to collaborate on. Another example is if I were to not separate the IO code into a separate module and instead spread the same code out into multiple places, then it would mean that if I want to change the code in one place, I would have to change it in all other places to remain consistent. And that would be very time consuming and error prone. And I can come up with several of these examples. And it's important to remember all of these reasons for why we architect code so that we remain pragmatic and focused on making the software easier to work with and don't get caught up with achieving a theoretical ideal, which can happen if you focus too much on the theory of software design and get caught up with a specific pattern or principle instead of focusing on the project at hand. Your project is never going to fit perfectly into one pattern or align perfectly with all of these principles. And while putting everything into a single function or a single file is obviously a bad idea, so is separating, abstracting and overgeneralizing every little thing. In the end, it's about striking a balance, and sometimes it's even better to just ask yourself how can I make this as simple as possible? Finally, what I've done here is certainly not the only way to do things. And what I've done is centered around this project and my limited perspective within the embedded domain. 
But at least I hope it has given you some insight in how you can think about software architecture when you're just getting started with embedded systems. Enough said, in the next video I'm going to create a simple directory structure that matches the architecture I've come up with here. I know, lots of logistic stuff to cover before I get to the actual implementation, but this also kind of reflects how it is to work with embedded systems, especially in a professional setting. I mean, programming an embedded system or programming in general is so much more about just writing code. That was all for now, see you in the next video.